Good morning. <clears throat> the uh, title of the last chapter of my book is What's Next? And the I don't waste any time. The first sentence of the chapter is Religious Totalitarianism in America. That is my prediction of what's next. Now, in the late 19th century, Nietzsche said, God is dead. And at that time, that was the consensus of observers of Western culture. A recent book gives our century's reply. Its title is, God is Back. <clears throat> now, if you look at the sheet I gave you, we found in surveying Western history six factors, one or more of which is necessary and sufficient to produce modal downfall and replacement. And uh, if you glance over that, the instability of a mixed mode, philosophic deficiency of an establishment mode's defenders, modal rebellion by the intellectuals apart from the people, modal rebellion by the public apart from the intellectuals, knowledge of an acceptable alternative mode, and triggers one or more. Now, if you run down the US today, you can see the D1, its instability, its falling apart. You can see that the Ds of both kinds are not only uh, philosophically deficient, but have turned philosophically into their own greatest liability. There is no new philosophy, and thus no rebellion in its name by the intellectuals who are committed to the status quo. But there are many signs of public rebellion led by men who know and approve only one alternative mode. As to the sixth factor, triggers, as I've said, <clears throat> we cannot predict or even delimit the triggers which could be decisive once the basic groundwork has been laid. The final straw uh, could come from anywhere. Uh, here are just some, some brief indications of possibilities, countless others. <clears throat> It could come from cultural areas. Moral outrage, for instance, over some establishment blessed anathema, such as uh, an egalitarian decree that hotel rooms must place every religion's key book, including the Torah and the Koran uh, next to the Bible, or a presidential election widely thought to be rigged against a religious candidate by secular media widely thought to be a mere arm of the secular government, or the packing of the Supreme Court with judges viewed as anti-religious, including, say, an outspoken partner in a gay marriage or an outspoken atheist, etc., or turning to economic possibility, <clears throat> inflation, runaway inflation, a 29-scale depression, taxes which simply cannot be borne any longer, national bankruptcy, and a middle class wiped out. And again, you can multiply. <clears throat> or in regard to foreign issues, escalating terrorist attacks on American soil met by U.S. appeasement or Western oil starvation met by U.S. appeasement, or foreign missiles and armies marching into Israel and Taiwan met by U.S. appeasement, accompanied by growing anger 
within our military. All of the above, some combination, none of them but something else, I don't know. The only relevant observation I can make here is that in one form or another, the basis for each of the above is already visible. Uh, when every failure of the secular government becomes a boost to the champions of the anti-secular, then the specific nature of these failures is irrelevant to the ultimate outcome. Now, the decline of the U.S. has often been compared to that of Rome. Now, uh, from my viewpoint, there is substantial but not complete validity to this comparison. Rome was the first Western culture to push a dissatisfied populace into the arms of an M2 religion, which was sneered at but unanswered by an establishment disdainful of philosophy. You know, there's a real parallel to the fall of Rome, but I don't think it's fully convincing. Because the Romans were guided by the M1 orientation throughout. Uh, you may therefore think that uh, their fall was much more thoroughly prepared than ours because they were merely moving from one version of M to another. <clears throat> the more exact parallel to the U.S. would have to be the takeover by M2 of a country run by the Ds. And there is one notorious, uh, unforgettable example of precisely that, and that was what has been described by Peter Gay as the first modern, in other words, D2, culture, the Weimar Republic. It was a hotbed of pioneering uh, D2s in every intellectual field, the source of almost everyone who we simply borrowed it from Germany. And I'm talking art, science, education, everything. And the political uh, establishment at the time was more old fashioned. They were D1. Uh, it was a coalition of three democratic parties, that is non totalitarian each concerned primarily with concrete bound compromises among pressure groups. Now, the D1s and the D2s were strongly against Hitler, but they neither offered philosophic opposition, partly because of their disdain for ideology, uh, and partly because there was a large element of M2 in uh, the German soul, which the alleged opposition uh, it believed implicitly or explicitly. Now, the German people as a people despised the Weimar Republic. They ridiculed the politicians savagely as unprincipled bumblers. They cursed the nihilists, and the term that they used at the time was uh, cultural Bolsheviks. And now, this is a mistaken term because it equates nihilism with communism, but it gives you the idea of their attitude. Meanwhile, the youth of Germany, which were roving bands of seemingly ungovernable, guitar-strumming hippies, that's what you could only call them in American terminology, told the world that they were disenchanted with everything adult that they saw around them. Well, all these disenchanted uh, kids and adults alike knew of only one alternative mode. And then there was the triple trigger in that context of so the Versailles Treaty, the runaway inflation of 23 and the depression of 29. And at that point, there was no possibility but that they would vote uh, Hitler into power. They voted him into power. 
like the rest of the country, the ungovernable youth at once fell into line. Hitler told them their duty and they dropped their guitars. And what they picked up instead, we know. Now I was asked a very good question. How can you predict the future of a D2 country if there's never been a D2 in the past? And I say, well, if you're looking at it narrowly, yes, I can't do it. But there is a lot of precedent for one more broad statement here. If a people find one mode intolerable and they know of only one alternative, they're going to go to that one. Uh, and that is a, a rule, whether uh, it's happened in the specific case of uh, D or not, and that's really what my, uh, what my <coughs> prediction rests on. Germany, in case you think it's inconceivable that this should happen in the United States, Germany was a highly educated nation. The democratic government was just as civilized, more so than Congress today. It was a culture whose uh, main voices were almost always on the left. And in that context, in that country, a maniac spewing the glories of blood and soil, regarded as a weirdo rightist, rose from the gutter to the throne and then virtually unopposed, annihilated the entire de enterprise. There wasn't even a recognition, a remembrance of it. They were all killed or ran. Before it happened, it seemed inconceivable. When it did happen, it still seemed inco inconceivable, and to many people, it still uh, seems so. But it happened. You want to know the details? Read my book, The Ominous Parallel. Now, I don't want to overstress this. There are limits to the German parallel. Whatever is true of the American sense of life, whether it's there or not, Americans are perceivably far more rational and individualistic than the Germans ever were. And to that extent, they are less susceptible to a totalitarian takeover. But the fact of this difference does not by itself invalidate the German parallel either. Think of this. The ancient pagans were far more rational and individualistic than the Christians. But they were slaughtered and wiped out. Virtue without consistency or defense is historically impotent. It doesn't help to say how good we are if no one, including us, can say why. Okay, that's my prediction. Now, as I told you, my theory aims to predict only the mode to come, not the specific form it will take. But I think within the context of the dim prediction, you can, from independent evidence, glean some idea of the specifics of what it'll be. Now, I've already indicated to you, I think, that in my judgment, the M2 movement in America in our era will be religious. It will not present itself as secular or as the means to worldly success, nor appeal to science as its validation. And I infer this not only from the statements of the current M2 leadership, whose favorite target is secular humanism, but also from the almost exceptionalist disrepute of the modern version of totalitarianism among everybody, including the intellectuals, after the horrors of Germany uh, and Russia. Social planners would be totalitarians now, I think, seem to understand 
that you cannot have an omnipotent government and an industrial level society together. And they don't promise it. And you see which side they are choosing, of which the ecological movement is just one example. Another reason uh, why I don't believe it'll be a secular type is that in America in particular, anti-communism is very strong. And any movement presented, even as socialism, let alone communism, would have no chance here. It, it would have to be uh, presented in terms that people, or most people, many people, uh, approve. We could also add here that since Heisenberg and all of the quantum mechanics and the reality of the unintelligible and so on that comes out of the physicists, uh, the prestige of science is not what it was 100 years ago. So the fact that science say, says something it does not have the weight uh, that it once did. Now religion, of course, is not restricted to one particular church or dogma. So you can't rule out several possibilities in this context. I don't think any of them are probable, but I can't rule them out. There could be schisms within today's Christian movement. Some favored branch could fade due to scandal. There could be actually a newly created uh, religion, which would be a true religion, but not the same as what we now know. We could be invaded peacefully, let us say, by a foreign uh, religion that was able to popularize itself. I think that's most likely on the two coasts. But if that happens, what happened? Now, I think any new contenders would have to offer at least some appearance of allegiance to Christianity, given our present state. Uh, but the result may no longer look much like the Christianity that's uh, familiar to us. The principle here is that a country ready for takeover cannot limit the invitation to only one candidate. Now, besides its religious commitment, I think it's highly probable that the movement will appeal to our very patriotic people uh, by stressing its admiration of America. The M2s uh, will declare and stress uh, continually that America is the greatest nation in history and that this greatness is an expression of God's choice and plan. Of course, you know, by its nature, the M2 mind will reinterpret Americanism, as I've already suggested last time. Individualism will become collectivism, the collective American nation so that patriotism will become nationalism, the nation uh, as an entity. Liberty will become obedience to morality, which comes from God. What do you think will happen to the capitalist advocacy of ownership and private property? It's almost a certain that any totalitarian taking over America would never preach uh, public ownership because it's too ingrained in people. It's much more likely that they will preach private property and scrupulously abide by all of it, uh, except one fact, uh, private property will be uh, retained in name, but used uh, by the government according to the decisions uh, of the state. It will be nominal uh, private property. And then we can perhaps project even further that if this new regime, once consolidated, follows the course taken by all of its predecessors, by all of its predecessors, it will adopt some version of group warfare, pitting its adherents who represent the good, you know, that would be 
the, the faithful church members, the proletariat, the Aryan race, against the rest of the world. And in this case, I think it's obviously God-fearing Americans versus godless foreigners. And then the idea will be we must give God's word the world dominance it deserves. The world dominance love of God requires. And so the regime in time, depending on the disposition of armaments, would probably seek to control the world's thought through some form of crusades against the infidels, wars of liberation like the communist actual crusades uh, by the uh, medieval. Now consider this. Private property as the announced but merely rhetorical policy at home, along with nationalist aggression to spread the truth abroad. Now there's only one previous totalitarian movement of who advocate these specific doctrines. They certainly could not have been a part of the medieval program because that was before nations, before the breakup of Christendom and before the uh, industrial revolution and the idea of a society of private property. And they certainly were not the program under the communists which demanded open public ownership of the means of production and insisted that they were interested in the nation, but only in the economic class. These ideas are the distinctive form of M2 advocated and carried out by Hitler and by nobody else. So I amend my uh, prediction to say not just a religious totalitarianism, but a religious fascist totalitarianism. And that is my prediction of the American future. So the question is now, <clears throat> when? When do I think it's going to happen? Well, let's, let's look again at some background. The Christians needed centuries after Jesus to take over the West, centuries. Not only did they lack technology, <clears throat> they had the very daunting task of turning pagans into, if not ascetics, at least admirers of asceticism. Now, it's true that the pagans at that point in the late M1s were very vulnerable. Nevertheless, it took the Christians a long stretch of time to defeat the ideas and values that were still being expressed as a result of M1's uh, worldly element. Now, the modern M2s, communism and fascism, by contrast, have been able to move fast. The communists, if you count from the Communist Manifesto until the takeover of Russia, took about 70 years. And Hitler emerging at the end of World War I, about 15. That's a big contrast from the 7th century. These moderns had technology, and they faced no meaningful philosophic opposition. The Soviets faced a long supernaturalist Russian Orthodox country, uh, in other words, a variant of their own M2 ideology, and the Nazis had the equivalent of that in their Lutheran Marxist nationalist uh, axis. Well, if the above facts are relevant, our own M2s will have a much easier task and take a lot less time than the ancient Christians. Uh, like their 20th century ancestors, the new Christians make full use of the available technology. They too are on what we've called the fast track of modern change. They too face no philosophical opposition. 
And they too, like the Nazis, stand to be the beneficiaries. Who else is going to be the beneficiaries uh, when the catalyst to big crises, the crises that shake people and say, we've got to throw it over and start somewhere else, who else is there to be the beneficiaries to speak up, to offer answers, and to be heard uh, by the whole country? Well, if we date the rise of the new Christians, I would say the movement started with the Reagan years. Well, he's the one that made the first alliance with the Muslims because they were religious like us uh, and presided over and benevolently smiled at the emergence of groups like the Moral Majority. So if you date from that time, uh, the M2s here have taken about 30 years to reach their current prominence. And they've made this progress in recruitment, in training, and then in cultural placement in the universities, in the business world, in the media, et cetera, with remarkable speed. Uh, a speed in gaining uh, an active, knowledgeable following of which at the time of Reagan, and I was there, no one would have dreamt. You just couldn't conceive. Religion was dead. I mean, it would never, ever get anywhere. It was a backwater in, in like, uh, Mississippi. Uh, that it happened is understandable, but the speed with which it happened. Now, that doesn't mean they're all the way there. Well, the M2 forces still need to produce our more intellectuals to disseminate their ideas more widely throughout the key cultural areas. Above all, throughout literature, throughout education. And then, only then in politics. And thereby create an ever-growing mass of people actually or potentially responsive to their program. They do not need a charismatic leader at this point at all. Uh, uh, if they get that far, you can be sure that a charismatic leader will jump up who knows just how to use uh, these uh, assets. So if the speed of M2 progress here is maintained, and the question is what is there, to slow it down, if it's maintained, I don't think it's undue pessimism to uh, estimate the time of takeover as relatively close. Now, as a different bromide from the one the narrower perspective that I, I quoted last time, it is certainly true that it is later than you think. Uh, now, remember that to succeed, the M2s do not have to convert or even appease the, the establishment. They can be spit out to the end. All they have to do is create and channel the pressure necessary to unseat it. Nor do they need a majority of the country. Merely an active, sizable minority who knows how to stride to a goal through the vacuum uh, surrounding it. And I think there's a couple other relevant factors in judging the uh, speed. One important one is momentum. Typically, a movement with, without opposition accelerates as it uh, develops. It grows ever faster as its strength opens more and more doors. Non-converts begin to see that's where everyone is going. More and more appointments to this or that position open the door for them to advocate more and more of their colleagues. And it starts slow and moves faster and faster. And remember also, that as bad as the opposition, as weak as it is, the D1s are still accelerating downwards into ever more impotence. 
So let's leave aside the issue of the American sense of life for a moment. We have to factor in the relevant time frame of the M2's modern antecedents in modally similar conditions, of course, abstracting away from inapplicable concrete differences. We have to consider the speed of the M2 progress here so far and the amount of preparation they must still complete. We have to try to estimate the time frame with, within which a decisive trigger or set of them could be expected to shake the country to the core. And we have to figure how long D1 is even going to be a minor factor. Now, taking all that into account, obviously no exact uh, figure uh, can be uh, reached. The best that I can do is to say that it's certainly going to be a hell of a lot faster than the time required by the early Christians. And it's going to definitely be much less rapid than Germany. I reach everything else being the same, a time span for the M2 takeover here, not of centuries, but not of single years either, of decades. That's the way uh, I, I think is the best way to think of it. Now, if a public disenchantment with Christians for some reason were to occur, that would slow them down and maybe a while before an equivalent rises. If there's a public disaffection with the establishment greater than that shown by the Tea Party, that may speed uh, the thing up. But ups and downs, you can't predict. Given the factors as being as specific as you can be, I think the M2 triumph will be complete within two generations. And it, it, according to the current evidence and the speed at which it's falling apart, I mean, not the movement, but the country, I could see it happening in a generation. But I'm not predicting it. I'm giving two generations to give the Christians plenty of time to do the, the necessary. Now, this time estimate rests on dim theory, but also on my reading of the current American scene. In other words, have I applied my dim categories properly to current America? My application could be mistaken even if the, the theory is sound. But I don't believe that. I'm just acknowledging. I don't think I am mistaken, and I'm prepared to stand by my conclusion. And moreover, I'll give you this commitment. If my prediction does not come true in the era between one and two generations at the most, that, in my mind, would refute it no matter what happens thereafter. I mean, anyone can predict a bad future, quote, ultimately, or in the long run. But that is Nostradamus. That is not a rational uh, prediction. If the M2s, given my reading of the current state of the US, cannot consolidate their power, in the next 50 years, I don't see how they can do so later. And I would then have no clue as to what's next. All the evidence right now supports the dim analysis. I know it seems fantastic to believe that this country is moving with a substantial rapidity toward an age of poverty, obedience, and secret police. But given the facts, where else are we headed? 
All right, now one more question. Am I certain of this outcome? Well, you know, certain means all of the evidence points in one direction, none in another. So if there is some evidence, some evidence pertaining to an alternative to the triumph of a different mode, then, of course, I am not certain. So that, of course, raises the question, is there some evidence? Now, if you're merely saying it's possible, you don't have to have a ton of evidence. It can be slender. Uh, and if you have, then you would say, depending upon the ratio, one is probable, one is possible. One is all but certain, the other is barely possible, however you qualify it. But as long as there's some, uh, you can't uh, put certainty on the other. And I do not believe that this M2 triumph is certain. Uh, I think it's probable. I go so far as to say it's so probable as to border uncertainty, but it has not reached certain. <sighs> and as you know, it, it, it has, before I give you the breadth of possibility, I want <clears throat> just to take into account that beside the evidence provided by the present state of America, there is the evidence provided by the past, the past going all the way back into the mists of history, as we looked at. Twice only, <clears throat> and for a brief span, the West has escaped from the pole of the primitive mind. That was Greece, a couple centuries, and the Enlightenment, one century. And twice it succumb. Uh, this is why I think the broader context in which an M2 future is so highly uh, probable. Given America's present conditions and the historical factors, it's really hard to overestimate the likelihood of its occurring. Uh, here is just an ex a statement that I think eloquently captures what is killing America? And I've heard this many times, as a, offered as a tribute to America. The U.S., it has often been said, is the most religious of the industrial nations, which is true. And at the same time has the strongest wall separating state and religion, which is true. And people think, isn't that a fabulous uh, tribute? But this is exactly the combination which would and will uh, destroy this country. Metaphysics trumps politics. A religious people at a certain point will end the separation of the state and religion and will make religion the ruler of the state. Now, <clears throat> before we look at uh, another aspect here, I want you to see uh, what the whole world conflict today is from the dim point of view, more broadly than just the M's and so on. I think it's a way of understanding on the deepest epistemological level the force that's pushing the country to this fatal destiny. You know that the fundamental premise of dim theory is that integration is the base of human thought. Well, if that's so, in the end, we would have to discover that all the fundamental conflicts among men are conflicts uh, in regard to integration. And we've seen this throughout. Uh, we saw it in Greece versus the later civilization concretized abstractions, 
versus semi-concretized ones. And then from the M1 to M2 semi, they're concretized versus floating. And all four abstractions, but in different combinations and to different degrees. But for the first time ever since Kant, the conflict takes the form of floating abstractions versus militant concrete boundedness. I was never endorsed and, and advocated before. Now, as a purely epistemological judgment, you have to say these are equally wrong. Floating abstractions and uh, concrete uh, boundedness. But I think the present state of the United States is evidence that men can tolerate the rule of one of these errors, but not of the other. They can live for millennia as they have, however poorly, when guided by concepts detached from percepts. And when in trouble, they yearn to go back to that state again. But it looks to me that they cannot for very long cope with life in a world of percepts detached from concepts because then they've given up totally any form, even a distorted form of the human means of, of, of functioning, and they, they simply can't function. And that, to me, is the deepest reason why D2, although it's inherently consistent, uh, cannot last. It can survive when it has the cover of the moderate partial conceptualizers of D1, but when they fall into D2, uh, people have to turn away from it. That's at least is the evidence. Uh, so now, is there a solution? Well, you know that the only way to uproot one philosophy is to replace it with another. Here, in this case, you replace D and M with some form of Aristotle. It was Aristotelianism that defeated the medieval M2s, and it alone can defeat their current ones. So my belief that an M2 success is not yet certain depends on my view that a resurgence of Aristotle is still possible. <clears throat> In my judgment, there is some evidence now pointing to an I revolution here, or at least to its germ. Put it another way, some evidence pointing to an I philosophy with cultural potential. Now, of course, I mean objectivism, which is Aristotelianism for the first time purified of all Platonic elements. Ayn Rand gives us a view of the world which is not floating abstractions and not unrelated concretes, but in the true thaling sense of the world, the one in the many. <clears throat> she is the unprecedented nemesis of all forms of M. In regard to the phenomenon of religion, her work leaves behind not, as the uh, Greeks and the Enlightenment did, a temporarily cowering body, but a corpse with a stake in its heart. Now, is it possible for such a radical philosophy to take root and spread in the U.S. within the time still left to us. Well, books normally stop selling when an author dies, fade away unless they're college mandated. As of 2010, Ayn Rand's books had sold over 26 million copies. 50 years after Atlas Shrugged, her publishers fainted when this, her sales skyrocketed and readership more than doubled. 
Now, you know also that there's a small but growing movement of her admirers such as yourself. Mostly, I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, among college students in the soft fields and professionals in the hard. Uh, that's my guess. How much, how many? Well, I would guess just from my <coughs> basically non-connection uh, that the number who accept and can in some understandable way state or articulate her fundamental principles. I don't mean her technical theory of concept, but fundamental in the sense used in this course, I don't know, five figures, six figures, I don't think uh, more than that. I mean, it depends what you define as fundamental. If by fundamental you mean pro-capitalist, there's a lot more. But that's not as what's going to change the culture. Now, that sounds like a small number, but uh, when I met Ayn Rand in 1951, when we went from five to ten, I said, wow, we doubled. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was a huge growth. Um, but of course, you know, you compare to the millions of M's and D's, they out do the eyes by a vast margin. We would have to be the smallest group today, except maybe the M1s who simply are dead. Uh, now, although many objectivists are active in cultural issues, there is as yet no appreciable Ayn Rand presence in the key field that we've been studying. There are some steps, but there's no acknowledged objectivist schools or this body of objectivist novels, or pioneers, Dave Harriman is, is the first and most important, in the field of uh, physics. So long as that doesn't exist, there is no culture that reaches the public. And uh, that is, uh, that's why I excluded objectivism as a cultural factor. It is making some inroads in the colleges, but that has not yet gone to a cultural level and therefore reached a, a broad public. There is, with great thanks to John Allison, uh, a significantly growing objectivist presence in the philosophy departments, but again, it's the beginning, as he put it to me once, it's the first shoots out of the ground while uh, the majority of uh, intellectuals, certainly in the humanities are still either ignorant of her ideas or hostile to them. So the movement <clears throat> is now real, it's growing, but it's still in its infancy. So the question is, can it in the time remaining train a new generation of intellectuals, establish a dominant presence in academia, which has to come first, and thence, from the graduates of that, the people that will give it the prominence in the culture, and then at that point, take over politically because of the mass space sharing those, those values. And, and when it reaches a cultural level, if it's there, reach down to enlist the, the nature loving, reason loving character of the vast American public, if that's what at bottom they really love. So you can see the lines. You can see the beginnings. Thing is this, uh, success in that kind of task, that's a very daunting task in our present circumstances is certainly not probable, uh, given the preponderance of the counter evidence. But is it still possible? Is there some evidence uh, to support at least the minimal claim that it is barely possible? I think so. I didn't, but I do now really in thinking it over. Because if you think about it, we have two assets 
which were never possessed by a country before in history. And they have to count at least for factors in judging the future. I think I, I mentioned them both, but I want to put them together now. One, we have the philosophy that we need formulated in its exact and therefore most powerful form. Uncompromised, uncontradicted. And two, we are addressing the only nation in history that has a double virtue. It was founded on ideas. It's the intellectual by its conception, not, uh, not by geography or tribal migration. It's founded on ideas, and the ideas were the ideas of the Enlightenment, which is the only century since the Greeks where uh, reason was dominant. Uh, and we have some evidence that those ideas may still be operative in some form in the people who are its heirs. <clears throat> now, if you put it negatively, you could say a largely unknown philosophy facing an unidentified national subconscious a certainly not a juggernaut of history. But on the other hand, it's, it is not nothing either. <clears throat> now, if you want to know what impossible would be, if you take Germany and Russia the last century, there was no such evidence on either or any other count. Nothing at all to suggest that maybe an M2 takeover would fail. No sign of an I uh, philosophy or movement, however small a sign, and no sign in the national past or in the observed character of the people to suggest that even if there had been a new philosophy, there would have been any kind of positive response to it. On the contrary, if you had uh, circulated Atlas Shrug to the Russian Orthodox uh, or the Weimar Republic, you could only imagine she would have been tarred and feathered. Uh, cases such as those define impossible in a historical context. And we are not yet one of them. So let's ask a time question again. If I is possible, when could it hope to take over, to win? How long would it take? Now let's assume for a moment the best from the I viewpoint. Uh, an active movement of objectivist intellectual spreading rational ideas to the academy and from there to the culture and from there to a receptive American subconscious. Now, of course, to assume the best, we have to posit that the I spokesmen remain free to write and speak. In other words, that they're not forcibly silenced by a, a theocracy that comes in and aborts the whole thing. How long would it take? <clears throat> If we judge by the I cases in the past, it takes a long time. We don't know how many centuries it took the Greeks to crawl out of primitivism and become rational men intoxicated by thought. But we do know that between Aristotle's first emergence and the triumph of reason in a culture, namely the Enlightenment, we're talking about at least three centuries. This is after they, they had the philosophy. So, how long? The new philosophy that we have is stronger than its predecessors. On the other hand, this very strength makes it an unprecedented threat to all the other modes who would do everything in their power to cut off the means of uh, communication, blunt the issues, Etc. Now, I'm going to finally come down to it. 
um, taking everything into account, it turns out that the most optimistic forecast I can reach matches approximately the independently reached projection of John Allison. We, or he reached independent, and then we talked to him. As you know, John is not an unworldly academic like me, but a uh, highly successful, and I think probably unprecedentedly philosophical banker. We think that it would take 25 years from now for objectivism to reach the point where we could see that in another 25 years, it would dominate the whole intellectual world. And from that point, about two generations, to move from the intellectual to the cultural to political dominance. So, in short, it would take something close to 100 years. In round numbers, a century to try and. Although I moderate that this way, if and when objectivism began to take major strides, that might very well slow down uh, the, uh, the enemy, because I said 50 years, other things being equal, but uh, you know, the bigger it gets, the slower <clears throat> they might get. Now a century sounds uh, really terrible. I know. But I don't think you can say it's pessimism. Uh, Kant counted on the whole entrenched Christianity uh, uh, and the whole progression of modern philosophy, which led to him. And it took him decades to take over the minds of the West and 50 years more to overthrow the Enlightenment politics. Uh, and he was like the this, uh, essence of the essence of the whole culture, or of their receptivity, put it that way. I don't think in the light of that, the projection of an objectivist victory requiring a century is undue pessimism. And besides that, Kant and his followers had the advantage of proselytizing in a free and stable I and then early D1 era, whereas today the probability of M2 success and D2 running wild means the improbability <clears throat> that even the partial uh, intellectual freedom we still enjoy can be sustained for another whole century. <clears throat> so if there is to be a race between M2 and I, it seems that one side will have, I don't say an insuperable advantage, but an almost insuperable advantage. The likelihood is that a religion will take over 50 years earlier and then remove the possibility of uh, public opposition. There can be ups and downs in the timing, but I don't think they're essential. Now let me repeat, there is still some evidence, however shrinking, of a better possibility. When I say almost insuperable, another way of saying that is can still be defeated because you have to put the almost in. And no one can validly remove the almost, not at this point. I do not believe anyone can prove that America has already passed the point of no return. Uh, I think we still have free will until the end, until we pass the point of return when free will makes no difference. But I actually think, this is not just your own forcing me to say this, <clears throat> I, actually, I actually think that we still could. Now a final word. 
The Dim Hypothesis is my final book. And I do not write it as Cassandra preaching resignation before the apocalypse. <clears throat> the high probability of a monstrous evil should not induce paralysis <clears throat> in those who see it coming. It should not lead to the end of action, but to the beginning. It is a paradox but the truth, the greater the size and speed of an approaching evil, the more it should motivate its opponents and victims. The more it should intensify their passion to defend themselves and their values against it, even when the odds of failure are high, so long as there is still uh, a chance of success. If your beloved is strolling unwittingly toward the edge of a cliff and you are so far away that even if you run at top speed and scream at top value, uh, top volume, you very probably will not be heard. Even then, you do not give up. Sit down and ponder the tragedy of life. Not if you really do love her. For every moment she is still alive, you keep on running and screaming. However much your lungs and your throat have turned to fire, you do it because rescue is possible, barely possible, but still really possible. Now, in most cases in life, the probable outcome by definition is what occurs, but not always. Across the ages, men have on occasion been able to achieve a cherished goal even when facing seemingly insuperable odds. And the greatest example of this in all history took place fittingly enough in ancient Greece. In 480 BC, in the Battle of Thermopylae, 300 Spartans led by King Leonidas repulsed for three days hundreds of thousands, Herodotus says millions, of barbaric Persian invaders led by Xerxes I. <clears throat> During the three days, the Spartans were killed down to the last man, but their indomitable character won out. The Athenians had been given time to prepare for and later win a decisive naval battle against the enemy. Against incalculable odds, the Oriental mystics had lost and Western civilization, which would otherwise have been strangled in its cradle, uh, had saved itself. Well, now in modern dress, the mystics are invading again, some of them from the same country. To hold them back, we too must be Spartans. And I'm here speaking about courage and endurance, not philosophy. If they were 300 to millions, that's about the same odds that we have. Now, to win the battle for America will not be possible much longer. So a piece of advice, if you care about the outcome, it's a good idea not to be too leisurely in entering the battle. Now, we all know that haste makes waste, but in this case, it might just make salvation. Thank you.
Thank you. I told a few people before the, this that I bet I'm not going to get any applause at all because they'll be so down. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, uh, if you like that ending, let me tell you that John Allison wrote it. <laughs> or <clears throat> to be... <clears throat> <clears throat> I'll tell you exactly what happened. I uh, called him on the phone one day and I said, I cannot end this book. Because if I end the book on, you know, how black things are, I mean, I don't want to just say goodbye, go to hell, it's hopeless, and <laughs> commit suicide. On the other hand, if I end the book with, oh, things are okay, don't worry, uh, you know, what's the point of the whole analysis then? <clears throat> so he said, he didn't have, I said, I was totally torn what neither were. He said, well, you just make a positive out of a negative. And I said, what do you mean? He said, show that it's been so bad, that should motivate you to go out and fight. And as soon as he said that, I got the whole idea of, you know, a positive uh, ending. He said, but however bad it is, that should be what you use to motivate them at the end. So I thought that was fabulous. It took a huge load off my mind. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I have some questions. Yes. Yes, can you hear me? I don't know. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that someone of your stature making a prediction quite so strongly about a Christian totalitarian state would involve the Christians and enable them to quote you and give them greater confidence that they are thinking. Well, if Christians are relying on me for, <laughs> for confidence, they are sadly mistaken, but it would really redound against them because if I know the future so well, uh, it must be on the basis of some other ideas. Maybe people would be interested to know how come. Uh, you know, the last thing any such movement would ever say, even if they thought there was something brilliant, you know, in another movement is to publicize it. And you want the other movement to be dumb, stupid, or worthless. Yes. Um, I'm, can you hear me? Yeah. No? Maybe it's not on. Can you hear me now? I can hear that, yeah. That's better. Um, I, I am a psychologist, and I work with a lot of Christian people in um, Roman Catholic Rhode Island. And what I am aware of is that the gift we offer them, objectivism, is so incredibly liberating that the content is one of our best values if we can, as you said, offer it confidently. We're not offering them <coughs> renunciation. And I wonder if you could speak to that, that the content of objectivism is, it's not no, just... You, oh, uh, let me just get you a claim, Alan. You're saying that whenever you encounter a Christian uh, uh, and you tell him about self-fulfillment and ego, he responds? Absolutely. Well, you got a very yeah. unique... <laughs> I have to say that you have a very unique group because if that were true, Adler Shrug should have done it. But I think that's what people in this room are doing. I think that's what your honor is doing in tea parties. Okay, I can see. You want to be optimistic. You don't <laughs> convince me. <laughs> If you brought 10,000 of them in to say that, I'll bring 10 million of them in to kill them. <laughs> yes? Your analysis is mostly focused on the United States. What other factors do you see outside and will have or any of the trend that you In other countries, you mean? Yes, in other countries. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the, uh, <clears throat> the Orient at all, so I wouldn't make any predictions. From the little I know, if the communes drop out and whether they will in China, I don't know. It doesn't look like they will. And that would be the next bastion of freedom if, if that were to happen. 
Um, <clears throat> the Middle East is hopeless. Uh, uh, but the main issue is Europe. And I think that Europe is in the same position as the United States, but without religion. And since they have no religion to turn to, uh, you know, no, not significant uh, the way it is in the United States, they are just D1, D2, or given up, they're just skeptics. Uh, and uh, since they can't continue that way, uh, and they don't have an indigenous religion, my belief is that they will be taken over by a foreign religion. They're very weak right now. They have no interest in defending themselves. They have nothing to defend. Uh, and uh, uh, the obvious candidate would be the Muslims, because Muslims are moving in very heavily uh, and introducing you know, Sharia, et cetera, in many enclaves, many places. I would see uh, Europe, as, I don't, you know, I've never studied it, but since it's the same Western philosophy, but with the religion cut off, uh, I would see it being taken over by foreign religion, or else if there's a Milton Christian dictatorship here, uh, I would see a crusade taking over Europe. But some religion, I think, how else are they going to function? And I think if you have a question about the uh, American receptivity to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, rational philosophy, you have a major, major more problem in regard to European receptivity because they never had the enlightenment instilled in them. You know, it was just a phase. So Europe is, is definitely a I mean, there's certain things about Europe that I think are way better than America. If you like operetta, I'd never look at an American one and go to France. And there's a lot of things that I think are superior. But if you're talking about the survival of the, of the whole continent as a, as a free or semi-free country, I don't think it's going to happen. And it may happen a lot faster than it happens here. <coughs> yeah. I think it's the oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I can't remember. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you mentioned specifically in your conclusion about uh, literature and physics being important areas to have um, objectivist cultural products. Is it, would you say that those are the most important areas or are there, are, I mean, can you rank different what? areas? What other one? Um, well, I mean, like education, for example. I mean, are, those, are literature, education, and physics the most important areas in which objectivists should be Well, producing? what other candidates would you suggest? Well... I don't have a good one, because the only thing that came to mind is music, but that's a perceptual level thing rather than it a conceptual what? level. It's, music is more perceptual oh, yeah. level. Yeah, so. you're not going to change your culture, but... Right. So <coughs> the, you, wouldn't, you don't have any other... Well, I picked or... those three because I think those are essential. But of course, I don't think just those three. The point of picking physics is that it is the metaphysics of science. All science is now applications of our pre derivatives of or presupposes physics, <clears throat> which wasn't always true. You know, in, in the Greeks were all these different subjects, and even as late as the waters of the 19th century, it was chemistry versus physics in big opposition, but now it's all physics. So if physics went on a rational basis, that would transform uh, all of science. And uh, that would be a, a massive undertaking, I mean, achievement. And Dave Harriman, in his book, The Logical Leap, as the first step ever within the objectivist movement to make a rational reconstruction uh, of physics and to present the method of how to do it. So that's the first big cultural leap, I would say, culturally, in the whole uh, development of the movement. Now, I think literature is crucial because art is crucial. And literature is the only art <coughs> that will disseminate ideas to a mass base and who will understand it and it will become articulate. Uh, you can have beautiful painting, beautiful sculpture, beautiful music, and people will, will love that. And now by literature, I include anything with words, like a, a play, a movie, even an opera. Uh, words have a, trem a tremendous power, but pure literature is the strongest, I think, because it, it's totally the conceptual. You go into that world. It's not diluted by a perceptual element. And that's why I think in, in educated Arabs, as against ours, there was a reverence for the great right. You know, uh, uh, Homer was like 
a hundred times more important to the Greeks than the biggest uh, authority uh, in, in, in politics or the best warrior. Uh, uh, Virgil, Dante, Milton, you know, and then you go to people like Hugo and so on. You need that. Now, Ayn Rand is a fabulous start. And I don't know, no one's going to, uh, you know, uh, I don't see anybody how they're going to equal her. But what we need is a, a stream of independent fiction, uh, novels, not nonfiction, worlds that people can go into and say, I love being in this world, or I just, there's a hero I enjoy, there's a character I sympathize with. It's an exciting series of events. Uh, and if it can be well done and not done, you know, in a, you know, in a mimicking Ayn Rand way. I've seen novels of a hero's going to shoot the basket and his hand went up just as Rourke's over the, you know, and the, his hair wasn't, wasn't orange, it was streaked with purple. I mean, all that stuff is no good. But if it's an independent novel that you write on your own because that is your sense of life, and if there's a lot of them, plays, novels, poems, whatever, then suddenly that becomes a factor, uh, you know, that maybe turn people back. You know, once uh, fiction was hugely more popular than nonfiction, and then fiction got so junky that it's now nonfiction uh, is uh, more popular. That's a very important. Education goes without saying. If you have, and once you have the art and the science, then you got something to teach in the schools. And, uh, but schooling, to start private school with kids from the beginning, from kindergarten or grade one, and take them at least through grade eight or nine, first you inoculate them against everything else that's coming. And it can be done in a way that is not proselytizing, is not propaganda, but they grasp the, just the method of thinking reasonably. And without that, you know, if you teach, you will find that every year you go higher, the kids are worse. High school kids are good. Freshmen in college, less good. Sophomore, you can tell already. Junior, senior, and graduate school, they're hopeless. So you have to get them young enough that they can withstand that bombardment and then go on and have uh, <coughs> rational careers Without that, you're not going to get anywhere. If you have, you know, all the books on science, all the literature, everything, but there's no place for them to go. But the public schools or the Catholic schools, you know, you don't have to get anywhere. So I would, I would urge anybody who's interested in the cause that place to put money is in the schools. The scientists and the, and the writers don't need, or they need little money. But to create an institution that's going to go somewhere, it should be, in my humble opinion, going to grade school. Now, I don't for a moment deny the importance of money going into the colleges. And, you know, if you don't get intellectuals, you're nowhere. But if you're interested on a cultural level, uh, and, and that's what I, and if you could find uh, that, that's what I would ask. Now, what else? I mean, there's a thousand other things. You could go into sex manuals. Sexology, and you know, that would make a lot of people happy. <laughs> but I don't know how much, you know, you could sneak in and say, you're really getting this uh, orgasm because A is A is. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, you were talking about the um, number of people who grasp the principles of objectivism within the society and what would you say in comparison, what, what instructive, what would you say we can instructively learn from the time of the American Revolution, considering the percentage of people was very low who let alone understood principles as such of the Enlightenment? Well, I learned two things in the American Revolution. If I understand your question, <clears throat> the basic philosophy on, in the name of which they fought, individual rights, limited government, and the fact that they had the, thought they had the means, the number of people in the armaments, and had the courage 
on that basis to go and take on the British Empire, which was, you know, the most powerful force in the world. So they were tremendously courage, courageous. So uh, I'm not going to draw a contemporary analogy, but um, it's always a possibility. That's, that's all I can say. That's opaque, but I don't think I'm allowed to say anything more. Yes, Jack. Oh, no, I have to go over here. Yes. I guess I have a similar question. I was wondering if you could comment on the American history does have one example, our Civil War, where we fought for a new freedom. Do you have thoughts so on that? So what do I think of the Civil War? Yes. Was no, I'm all in favor of the Civil War because the flaw, the flaw of the Constitution, which they couldn't avoid at the time because they would never have been able to make a country, was the, the issue of slavery. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Armand always said and that the proof of the the virtue of the United States is that all the other countries in history made slavery one of their institutions. It couldn't survive with slavery. It had to wipe it out in order to go on. So that, uh, that is, I, I disagree 100% with Lincoln uh, making the draft uh, under the Civil War and suspending habeas corpus, uh, but uh, with, with the existence of war, yeah. Now, I have to say that there are times when I'm in a fantasy world and I know it's not reality that I uh, enjoy reading Gone with the Wind. But I know, you know, that her portrait is very, very skewed. That. There's another country where they, you know, huge Louder. population. Louder. There's another country with a huge population, significant Western influence, um, and an entrepreneurial... Uh, okay, what is it? I was thinking, what about India? What? What about India? India? And its fluence on the... You know, I know that India has developed a lot, and although in the days of Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand wrote about the mystic muck of India, and that's in God's speech, since that time, I gather India has uh, developed uh, somewhat more freedom. And whenever I see a war between India and Pakistan, I'm always on India's side. But having given that, I said that I know nothing. I'm not uh, omniscient. I studied Greek, I studied Greek philosophy, and that's it, and whatever I could find as a derivative. And for sure, India does not have a derivative of Greek. i would say one more, and then I want to make a brief statement before we close. Uh, who is next? Yeah. Thank you. Um, particularly, as you mentioned in your uh, lecture, that the w attraction of worldly goods was a problem the M2s were facing. I was wondering if you could comment on um, some of your uh, rationale that M1 is dead. I mean, I understand it's intellectually dead, yeah, but there seems... Right? Yeah. M1 uh, is dead. You have to read my, my book for that. Um, M1... Uh, is a, a compromise, a, a combination of uh, reason and faith. And it's possible only when reason is a strong element in a culture. In the post-Greek period, the Greek were still a strong element. Once Aristotle was introduced in the medieval period, there was also a strong element. Uh, so you could try to combine them. There is no Aristotle since Kant. There's no Aristotelian element at all. So there's nobody to combine it. Now, the only people that you would consider conceivably were uh, the combination would be the mainline churches uh, and the Catholic churches. And I, I, I studied them just to see, do they try to in some way... Uh, and the main thing I find is that they're non-ideological. They have no particular views, and they pride themselves on being, quote, accommodating to the mainstream. Which means they believe in God. Uh, they, uh, they have some D1 compromises. They think some of the D2 artists are great. And in fact, one of the later trends in, among these, uh, uh, these people is, uh, uh, why should we be restricted to some particular dogma? And a number of them have said, we don't even believe in Jesus. But we believe, you know, 
in, in a higher power and we go to church, but it's mostly, it's a dead. The, the, the mainline Protestants have lost, I believe it's 30% in the last 20 years. It's just fading away as a, as, as a factor because it has no ideology. It's just, it's carried on by tradition. You'll never get a cultural factor uh, out of those people. The Catholics would be more conceivable. But, you know, Catholicism is going to be a long time before it comes back in the picture as a moral uh, force, if ever. You may very well have seen the end of uh, Catholicism as a power. You know. All right, I want to say something here on my own. If you give me five minutes. I want to uh, thank three different people. Number one, your own. Uh, without him, I don't see how there could be a movement. He, as I think of him, is the CEO, not of the Institute, but of objectivism. Uh, uh, I admire what he does. I could never dream of equaling it not just because of my age, but if I was any other age, how he can spend 24 hours a day teaching and then also 24 fundraising and then 24 proselytizing and then inspiring his whole staff and then going on vacation. <laughs> uh, he is indefatigable and unflappable. And I'm very happy to leave him in charge of the whole uh, movement. He is one of the few people who connect ideas to reality, who see reality implications in ideas and ideas implications from facts. One of the very few in my life. Now, I have to tell you, this is one last compliment to him. He is the only person after Ayn Rand that I frequently, well, I didn't email her, but ask some question about the world, economics, politics, foreign policy, and then he answers me, and I copy it down and use it. So, thank you. Now I want to thank John Allison, who is where? Where are you? Okay. Um, uh, there is so much to say about John, but if I could just look first as, in objectivist terms, he is the man more than any other who gave objectivism access to the real outside world. Wouldn't you say that? To, to People in power who respect him, uh, he's had a tremendous uh, influence in the business world and, and in the university world. He bought out the whole southeast corner uh, of the United States. He is a nonstop uh, fighter uh, for freedom and he is really, really philosophical, uh, as I, I said in my lecture. I want to tell you one, and I told you really about him giving me the dim ending, but I want to tell you one other thing which means a great deal to me from him. I wrote Opar, oh, long ago, 20 years, and, uh, you know, I get letters from objectivists saying how good it is, but I hadn't, it doesn't change anything in the world that I can see. Uh, and after a while you figure, oh, I worked so hard, what's the point? Uh, it didn't stop me from doing another one, but still, there's, there's a, 
They said, what's the point? And John is the first one who actually convinced me that there was a practical, concrete point. Not just, oh, someday it'll change the world, but he, he told me concretely and personally how some of the points that I made at OPAR were put to work in his bank in order to help it uh, function and grow and develop. And at first, I didn't believe him at all. <laughs> I thought, he's just giving me, you know. But uh, he's, he's gone on that theme several times, and he actually convinced me. And that gives me a, a, a great uh, feeling that uh, it's actually worth it uh, to do all that work that it achieves something. Because if it helps somebody do something like that in a real bank, that is much more important to me than that in 100,000 years from now, people will read it in the school. <clears throat> now, Carl Barney, my last, I want to think, where is Carl? You're okay today? Okay. I love Carl. Uh, he's a committed, long-term objectivist, super intelligent, super relaxed, super happy. And what I want to say today as a specific why I want to thank him is I want to just mention how unbelievably generous he has been to me. Now, it's in bad taste to give numbers. But I want to tell you just this story. One day he said to me, what would make you happy? And, you know, I, I said, I'd like to get a decent audience for my podcast, <laughs> which is, you know, and he said, okay. <laughs> and the next thing, he had hired this super powerful, the national marketing firm with all kinds of big clients. And they came in and said, you want an audience? Here's it. We take over. And they made the new website. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, they made the search engine, and I thanked them at one point and said, well, I really appreciate it. They said, no, no, we just began. They've got all this campaign, and it's all due. I get seven executives at a time phone in a conference call, and believe me, they're not calling to impress me. So um, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Carl for being really nicer than anyone has ever been in that way to me. Thank you. <laughs> and now just the final point why I'm saying all this now. Because I am retiring. Um, I am no longer to be identified as an individual whose profession is philosophy. Uh, I certainly will finish my book, and I don't write off the possibility as a side issue occasionally of giving a speech or whatever. But no more courses. You attended the last one. No more books. Uh, no more even lengthy essays or intros. My last tie to philosophy, which I enjoy, is the podcast. And the reason I do is it was the exact opposite of abstract uh, philosophy, which I've had 60 years of, and that's just enough. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm going to be the Dr. Laura of objectivism. <laughs> Uh, I get questions that are from young people that I really enjoy because they, are, they want philosophy to help them solve problems that they don't know what to do with here and now. You know, uh, I went with this girl for three years and she's perfect and she just did that. 
Our wedding date is set. Is it okay to go ahead? <laughs> uh, and I really mean something to these people. I don't know that I'm that qualified uh, to answer, but uh, that's, th that's one of the things, the other thing. So I probably won't see many of you uh, again. I see there's a lot of new faces here. There's some people who have been coming for a long time. But either way, I want to thank you all for your interest and your support, your interest in my work. I want to say goodbye and go out and give them hell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.